The scripture reading today is from Psalms 51. It says 1 to 19, but that's the whole psalm. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee alone, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I, have shapen in, I was shapen in iniquity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with his path, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide, my, hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressions, transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from, from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy Good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall thine offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Okay, how's that? That sounds better. Yes. Okay, Philip Griffin tells of a man in a restaurant who ordered a Coke. Well, when it arrives, he takes his Coke and he throws it in the waiter's face. Now, this, that server, he's, he's ready to fight, but, but the man says, oh, I'm so sorry. I have this horrible compulsion. I can't help it. Whenever someone hands me a drink, I throw it in their face. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm working hard to overcome it, would, would you bring me another Coke? Well, the, 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 the waiter asked, did you promise not to throw it in my face? The guy says, I'm gonna do everything I can to not throw it in your face. I'm working so hard to resist. So the waiter agrees, he comes back with a second Coke. Again, the guy throws it in his face. You said you wouldn't do that. The waiter complains. Well, the man apologizes. Oh, this compulsion is so strong. I promise I'll check myself into an inpatient clinic to get help. Forgive me, I am so sorry. Well, feeling genuinely sad and guilty, this, this man receives a month of intense psychotherapy. Then he, he returns to the restaurant. He tells the waiter, I'm cured. Give me a drink. The waiter's cautious. I had to change my shirt last time you were here. Are you sure you're cured? The guy assures him, I know I'm cured, I promise. Okay, the waiter says. If you're cured, I'll bring you a Coke. And he does. The man receives it, and he throws it in the waiter's face. I thought you said you were cured, the waiter said. 
I am cured, the guy explains. I still have the compulsion, but I don't feel guilty about it anymore. <laughs> now, it's a ridiculous story, isn't it? But, but, but it, it exposes a common instinct, doesn't it? How often, when we feel guilty, do we try to manage our feelings instead of addressing the underlying sin? That was certainly David's strategy. The Lord had chosen him, a man after the Lord's own heart, and had appointed him ruler of his people. The Lord established David on the throne of Israel. Everything's going well. David is at the peak of his reign, enjoying every blessing of God. Then, in this tragic moral crash, he abuses his royal power, he has sex with another man's wife, and then, desperate to cover up his sin, arranges for his faithful friend Uriah to be killed. It is this, this awful, ugly spiral. The story is told in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it looks like David's getting away with this ugly betrayal. He's still king. Publicly, he looks good, but his soul is a mess. In Psalm 32, he, he describes the agony of unconfessed sin. He tells the Lord, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. The Lord wouldn't let him alone. Now, was, was he being cruel to David? Not at all. If I've done wrong, I should feel guilty. God has etched a standard, a, a benchmark in our hearts. In the second chapter of Romans, Paul calls it a conscience. If our conscience is healthy, it will sound the alarm when we sing. It will not let us rest. Now, sometimes we, we also contend with false guilt. When, when our hearts accuse us, even when we haven't done anything wrong. So, so if a loved one dies tragically, sometimes family and friends will feel guilt. If only I had done this, or if only I had done that, I, I could have saved her. She might have been alive if I had been there. There, there are a lot of different situations where a person might feel so, false guilt, but there's no sin to confess. Right? The, with false guilt, we, we still need truth. We still need the Lord to speak his truth into our hearts to set us free from that, but it's a different, it's, there's a different route to healing than, than with true guilt when, when we've sinned. True guilt is a response to sin, and that is what weighs on David. How can, he live with, how can he live with himself? How can he face God? His reflex is to hide. Can you identify with him? It's a pretty ingrained reflex. It's there right from Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve take the, that fruit of the garden that the Lord had forbidden to them after they sinned. Their, their impulse is to hide When you think of a situation when your feelings of shame pushed you into isolation, maybe you're even in that situation now. Right when we should reach out for help, we throw up our defenses, we hide. David, in 2 Samuel 11, he's stuck. And so the Lord, in his love, his holy love, he sends the prophet Nathan, who brings him a disturbing report. So 2 Samuel 12, Nathan tells, tells David, there were two men in a certain town. He tells this story. One rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. He had bought, he raised it, 
And it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep and cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come. Now, enraged by this kind of sin, David cannot help but pronounce judgment on that rich man. In that moment, he has such great moral clarity. You know, we, we, we tend to see more clearly when it's someone else's sin, don't we? Then, as he stands there full of righteous anger, Nathan drops the bombshell. You are that man, he says, and he lays out the heartbreaking details of David's sin. He, he was the man who had abused his authority, who had done such evil. So that the heading of Psalm 51 places it in this moment when David's deceit is stripped away and he finally admits, I have sinned against the Lord. But, but why is it here in our Bibles? Have you thought about that? I mean, you can ask that about lots of different, different scriptures. Is it just to tell us how a king long ago prayed when his sins were exposed? Is it just like an historical record? I mean, it is that, but it's also a model. Even if our offenses are different than David's, even if we feel like they're in a different league somehow, we have all sinned against the Lord. In a poem by John Donne, he imagines Resurrection Day, a day when Jesus returns, and uh, we're raised from the dead. Since it will then be too late to ask for forgiveness, John, John Donne, in this poem, he begs the Lord, here on this lowly ground, teach me to repent. Teach me to repent. Here and now, when I have the chance, teach me to repent. So to repent is to do a big U-turn, to stop hiding or defending our sin and instead walk with the Lord in faith. So with the repentance, we realize we're heading, we're heading in a direction. We're heading toward destruction. And so we turn away from that and we turn to the Lord and we start walking with Him. So repentance is more than a prayer. It requires a real change in our lives. But repentance begins <laughs> as we confess our sin to God. So confession is important, but it's not the whole story of repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Does David try to bargain with God? No. Does he try to make a case for why he would deserve forgiveness? No. There is no way that he could earn or merit the grace of God. By definition, forgiveness is something that we do not deserve. <laughs> How could he ever make up for his sin or repay his moral debt? So he, he begins with just a simple plea for mercy before his righteous king. The Lord doesn't owe us anything. Our, our world, especially in this time, really kind of trains, trains us in, in many ways to feel entitled. But the Lord doesn't owe us anything. We can make no claim on his favor. Like David, we can only approach him based on his character, not our, not our own, only on based on his unfailing love, based on his great compassion. Now, David, he, he also knows. He knows that the Lord is holy and righteous, but here, in these verses, he echoes the Lord's own words in Exodus 34. So when, when Israel, the Lord had freed them from slavery in Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, and there, even after the Lord had revealed um, his heart to them, his, his glory, his his commandments, they, 
They worshiped a golden calf. (laughs) The Lord judged their sin and punished them, but he also gave Moses a fresh revelation of his glory. He passed in front of Moses. Moses had asked him to reveal himself afresh. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So knowing the Lord, David appeals for mercy. Now 3,000 years later, we have an advantage David didn't have. (laughs) Because we live on the other side (laughs) of the coming of Jesus Christ. We know that he, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. And so we can pray with far greater assurance than even David could. Looking at the cross, we see his extravagant grace so clearly. And so in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Like David, we can cry out, to the Lord, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now David uses three words for sin here. The the Hebrew for transgression speaks of, of violating trust, rebelling, going against God. It's crossing a boundary. Iniquity especially emphasizes a bending or twisting of God's purposes, a distorting of his will. The word translated sin conveys that I've, I've missed the mark. I've missed the goal that the Lord set for me. So using them together, David shows how thoroughly he now sees, how thoroughly he now understands the ugliness of his sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me, he says. This isn't just head knowledge or or a superficial awareness of my sin. Repentance doesn't actually come naturally for us, does it? John Golden, Golden Jay points out that partly because we're usually busy making excuses to ourselves for what we've done or not done, right? So, so we have, have some, some pretty deeply rooted human instincts that we tend to justify ourselves, we tend to see ourselves as righteous, we tend to make excuses about our sin, we, we rationalize it, we minimize it. In others, we see it pretty clearly. <laughs> but something shifts when I can honestly say, I know my transgressions. I have this glimpse of how the Lord actually sees them. No more arguments. Like David, I admit I'm at fault. I violated my relationship with God. I grieve my sin. I commit myself to not repeat it. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now this seems odd, doesn't it? Because David committed adultery against Bathsheba and had her husband killed. So, So his sins are not private sins. He horribly victimized that couple. And and that the Bible does not sweep that under the carpet at all. There's a clear principle running through Scripture that that when we sin against others, we need to take responsibility. That that we need to do all we can to to try to make it right, even even if we can't reverse what we've we've done. so, So there are laws in the Old Testament about about restitution, about, about, you know, if someone has st- stolen something to repay like four times as much. Or Jesus, when, when he's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, says if you're going to worship and you remember that your brother has something <laughs> against you, you know, first leave your gift there, go back and make it right with him. Right? So there's a process and relationship about seeking healing, trying to make things right. So this does not negate that at all, but the emphasis is different. Because all all sin 
no, mat no matter who is involved at the human level, all sin is ultimately against the Lord and violates our relationship with him. And so David prays, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. True confession means I fully accept God's judgment. I stop trying to justify myself. Stop trying to excuse myself. I, I lay down my own crooked moral measuring stick and I accept that the Lord is completely right. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Each of us is created in the image of God. Each of us is precious to him. And at the same time, each of us is thoroughly corrupted by sin. It affects every part of us. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't still reflect the glory of God <laughs> or, 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 or that, that we can't have a desire for him. Right? We need, both of these things are true about us, that we are created in the image of God, precious to him, and at the same time, broken deeply by sin. We we are, have a bent toward it, an impulse <laughs> towards sin. So David doesn't say, well, you know, really, I'm a good person. My whole misuse of a power, sleeping with a married woman, ordering the death of her husband, well, that was kind of out of character for me. Right? That was, <laughs> no, no, his sin is not a freak event in an otherwise blameless life. He admits it's part of a pattern part of a pattern, even if we haven't read a whole lot about it up to this point. He didn't simply mess up. He is a sinner. So am I. Do you see yourself in this too? Even so, even so, even knowing I'm a sinner, that's not an excuse. Right? We can't just say, well, everyone is a sinner, and so, so somehow my sin gets lost or covered kind of in this whole, whole sea of sin. No, it's not an excuse. David prays, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So God created us to honor him. He gives us the responsibility and resources to resist sin. When we're honest like David, we recognize that, that that massive gap between our behavior and what the Lord desires. Cleanse me with hyssop, he prays, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Only the Lord can cleanse us. We can't do it ourselves. When the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, the Lord forced Pharaoh to set them free by bringing a plague of death on the land. For protection, he told the Israelite families to smear blood from a lamb on the door frames of their homes. Now, to do that, they used branches from the hyssop plant. Later, the Lord had them use hyssop, branches from the hyssop plant, in rituals for cleansing people from sin and impurity. Those sacrifices and ceremonies were signs pointing forward to Jesus Christ, who once and for all shed his own blood on the cross to cleanse us. So when we turn to Jesus in faith, he is the one who wipes away our sins. He washes away our spiritual dirt. He frees us from moral impurity and contamination. Praise God. Praise God. David cries out, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. What joy it is to be forgiven. Do you know that joy? Do you, that, do you know that joy of being forgiven your sins? There's no other path to peace. Guilt management doesn't work. Hiding just makes it worse. You need to get to the root of the problem, your sin, and bring it into the light of Jesus Christ. That's been the focus of the psalm so far. 
helping us join David in honest confession so that we are positioned to receive the grace of God. But that's not enough for our sins to be wiped away. Our need is far, it, it's, it's not enough for our sins to be wiped away. Our need is far deeper. So c- create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So David prays for a miracle. We all need it. Steeped in sin, we cannot change. Not really. We can make some superficial changes, but not, we, we can't do that, that deep change we need without God's help. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord tells his people about a coming day. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. So by that point, the pattern of sin in his people in Israel was, was so clear. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and, and be careful to keep my laws. So Jesus is the one who made this possible when he was crucified for us. Not only that, he offers it to us today. Not only forgiveness, as important as that is, but a new birth, the death of our old sinful self with its stony heart and the gift of a new self filled with the Holy Spirit, Christ living in us. Sometimes a person who's ready to make a big change will talk about turning over a new leaf. This goes way beyond that. This is a miracle that Jesus gives as we surrender our life to him. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Nothing could be worse than being cut off from God because of our sin. There is is nothing worse. And yet it is what we rightfully deserve. Praise God for the mercy that he shows us in Jesus. Next Sunday, we plan to celebrate the Lord's Supper here at Mapleview. The the, the word communion speaks of the intimate fellowship we can have with the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father. We could never be worthy of it. It's a gift, ours through the mercy of our Savior. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Do you know that joy? Do you know that joy of salvation? When you know that you've been rescued from the pit of hell, you cannot help but rejoice. And yet again and again, we need the joy of our salvation restored, don't we? How many other things compete for space in our heart? Stuff that pushes out that joy of salvation that Jesus brings to us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, Lord. Now, do you also long for a willing spirit, keenly focused on the heart of God, eager to please him? That's a willing spirit. David once had it. He's known as a man after God's own heart. But somehow, in his prosperity, in his rise to power, he lost it. What about you? Do you delight in the Lord? Is your spirit in tune with him? Are you eager and hungry to grow in your love for him, to pursue him, to seek his kingdom? Because that's the antidote to temptation. (laughs) This willing spirit, this eager spirit, seeking after him. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and so that sinners will turn back to you. So David, even even in this moment, he wants to serve others. He, He wants them to benefit from his experience, painful as it is. As a forgiven sinner, his life, he knows, could still testify 
to the power and grace of God. William Temple, years ago, made a a keen observation. He said, it's quite futile saying to people, go to the cross. We've got to be able to say, come to the cross. There's quite a difference in that, isn't there? There are only two voices that can issue that invitation, that can, can give that invitation, come to the cross. One is the voice of Jesus, our sinless Redeemer. He can say, come to the cross. But the other is the voice of the forgiven sinner who knows himself, who knows herself forgiven. That's our part. Are you a forgiven sinner? If you are, then you can invite others to join you at the cross. It's our greatest privilege in this life. Will you join me there? Will you join me there at the cross? Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. When you truly acknowledge your sin, confront your sin, and receive the mercy of God, you can no longer sing your own praises. You you want to sing His. David knows this. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Father, thank you. Thank you that you were not content to see your people, to see humanity trapped in sin, separated from you, condemned but that in your mercy you devised a way that we could be saved a way that honors that would honor your holiness your righteousness and at the same time show such incredible mercy to us thank you that on the cross Jesus The righteous one took our place. We who are unrighteous. That he exchanged his purity and took our sin on him. And that he suffered. That he suffered the punishment in our place so that we could be washed clean, that we could be set free, that you would be able to look at us and and see the innocence of your Son. Lord, we can scarcely fathom it. Yet we thank you. And we ask, Lord, that, that you would continue to teach us Um, continue to show us, continue to take us deeper in the reality of your love, what you have done for us on the cross. Lord, we know that all eternity won't be long enough for us to adequately give you thanks and praise, and yet, Lord, we want want to live for the praise of your glory. Lord, you know each one of us here. You know where we're at in our relationship with you. And so, so, Lord, I, I, I ask that, that your Holy Spirit would be, would be working in each of our lives and that, that you would clear away any kind of confusion we might have about where we're at in our relationship with you, any confusion we might have about our sin. Lord, if, we, if there is any unconfessed sin, Lord, we pray that you would not let us rest until we bring it to you. 
Lord, free us from false guilt. Help us to discern the difference. But Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work on us, on each of us, so that if there's anything at all hindering our relationship with you, that in your mercy, you would enable us to bring it to you. And Lord, if it's something we need help with, Lord, give us courage to talk with the trusted brother or sister. Lord, thank you that 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 is so often a gift that you use when a person has struggled with a sin or has struggled with feeling forgiven, that, that so often your Holy Spirit has used used a brother or sister who can who can help convey that. We thank you. We thank you for that promise in First John chapter one. Where you say, if you confess your sins, God, you, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, even even now we 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 want to take a moment Moment of silence, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us in this space. Lord, let us know if we have some agenda with you. Thank you that you are compassionate. And if the Holy Spirit has brought any, any sin to, to your mind, I invite you to, to bring it to the Lord right now. Come to the cross. Place it there before him. Thank you, Jesus, that this isn't ours to carry anymore. This isn't mine to carry anymore. And Lord, if there are steps that you're asking us to take, if there have been wounds or in, in, in injury, we've injured others, hurt others, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would also bring clarity about what steps you're asking us to take. We thank you that you're a restoring, reconciling God. That you also want right relationships. Want us to have right relationships with others as well. And so even as we head from here today, Lord, we, we ask that, that you would continue your work in us. We ask, Lord, that you would... Um, Bring us to that place of experiencing that pure heart, that steadfast spirit. We pray that you would create that in me, in us. You would restore to us the joy of your salvation. If there's anyone who has not experienced your salvation, and for the first time, Lord, we pray that you would bring them into your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to them with grace and power and that you would enable them to trust you, to walk in faith with you. We pray in the strong and precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.